When I was growing up, I lived on a dead end road, and about three quarters up the way of a dead end road. And it was uh, a nice place. Went to church once in a while until I figured out that I could stay home with dad or go with mom, and guess what I did? I stayed home with dad. So I wasn't really raised in the church. And there was a neighbor that was just down the hill from us, down the road towards, the, towards where it turned off the main road. And we had some fallings out, you might say, this kid, he's the same age as me, about old, 10 or 11 years old at the time. And he got mad at me. I can't even tell you why. But he got mad at me. And from the time he got mad at me, he would challenge me to a fight every time I walked up the hill. See, the bus, school bus let us off at the, the bottom of the hill, and we had to walk up the hill to our house. They didn't go up the hill with the bus. We got to walk. But on the way home every day for about two weeks, this kid would challenge me to a fight. I said, I don't want to fight you, Alan. There's no reason for it. But one day I'd had enough and turned around and knocked him down. And we had a real tussle. I came out on the good end of it. We still didn't talk after that. And I hadn't thought about Alan until we started attending a church in Somerville, South Carolina. And I was baptized in the Lord. And this was, how old was I? Yeah, yeah, 25, 30 years after the fight. And after I was baptized, and I haven't shared, shared this with Sally, I, it dawned on me that I needed to forgive Alan. I mean, that was many years before that, but I still, I, I needed to forgive Alan. And I did. Because the Lord came into my life. And I understood what forgiveness was. This little church in Somerville, South Carolina, Somerville Christian Church, it was, that's where I learned forgiveness. That's where I accepted the Lord. That's where I started a new life. They're the ones that sent us off to Bible college. But I learned forgiveness in that little congregation. You know, when we come around the table, the Lord wants us to be clean. He wants us to have an, a repentant heart. He wants us to be the children that he went to the cross for. And when we partake of this communion, we need to remember the precious gift that God gave for us in the blood and the body of his son. It's a, it's a time to remember him. At the Pew Factory, we put out communion tables that have in remembrance of me across the front of them. And I thought, I thought about that when, I, when uh, Randy was makes those tables. I, I see them being assembled and I see them going out to installs and I wonder if people really realize what that means. We need to remember Jesus as we gather around this table. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, 
the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed and took the bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the, uh, the bread together. Didn't mean to surprise people with that. Okay. The bread's in the bottom cup. Okay. Let's partake of the bread. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We have an amazing God, don't we? We do. And he's given us the opportunity to receive forgiveness and to forgive others. Amen. Amen. I'm not used to sitting in the back of the church, but it seems to be a popular place in this <laughs> congregation. We're very happy today to have with us Kent and Cindy Perkins. I was just thinking now about how long ago we met, and I didn't realize you were that old. Uh, <laughs> it was about 49 years ago. Uh, a little older, in fact, but we, had, we weren't married yet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, now, I've known Kent then for a number of years. When I came to Dallas Christian College, uh, he, was the, he became the business manager there. Now, I knew his mother quite well. She taught uh, the business at the college. And I understanding, now I may be wrong, but well, my understanding was that Kent came just to visit her. And he wasn't all that interested in a Christian college or that kind of thing. He just came to visit her. But he saw something there that attracted him. And then he saw somebody else <laughs> there that attracted him. And he and Cindy married. And he was at the college for, what, about Seven years, eight years, nine years? No, we were only there two or three, but we left after Sebastian, you know. Okay, all right. And uh, he has since become a preacher. He's preaching in the Kaimishi Mountains. Now, his wife, Cindy, I've known since she was, well, since before she was. Uh, <laughs> Riley, Donica, and I were roommates in college one year, and then Riley ended up marrying uh, their mother. Jane, Ethel Jane. Ethel Jane, I remember I the Ethel part. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, Riley ended up going back to the Kaimichi Mountains to serve there. And now uh, Kent and Cindy are preaching at the Zafra Church of Christ in Zafra, Oklahoma, in the Kaimishi Mountains. Now, I can remember the first time I went to the Kaimishi Mountains, trying to find a town by the name of Honobia. Nobody we stopped and asked had, no, had any idea where Honobia was. H-O-N-O-B-I-A. That's Honobia, isn't it? It's Honobia. It's Honobia. 
Well, we've pronounced it right. Oh, yes, you mean Ho'nubi. But anyway, it's been a tremendous change in that area. Churches have been started through the Kaimishi Mountains Christian Mission, and the church where uh, Kent is preaching, Zafra is one that before him, his father-in-law was the minister. And Kent has worked hard. And I told him now, wear your cowboy hat, and I'm going to introduce you as a cowboy preacher. So before Kent preaches this morning, I'm asking that Cindy, if you will, please bring our special. Expressed 
I normally don't wear a cowboy hat inside, but Brother Newland told me to. He used to be my boss, so I'm going to do exactly what he tells me, like I always, I always did, didn't I? Or did I? Well. Most of the time. <laughs> I got to tell you a story about him, though. He, and I often think when we talk about faith, I think about him, and I don't know for sure if it's, you know, the, you talk about blind faith. Well, he knows about blind faith. I used to, we used to have an airplane, and I flew him several places back out of Dallas Christian College. And Anyway, one day we were supposed to go someplace in New Mexico and uh, where he was going to speak that weekend, he and Bernie Ayers, vice president. So we were going to leave about 4, 4.30 that evening. I had plenty of time to get to where we were going. And I'd called in to, any pilot does this, you call in, find out what the weather's going to be. Well, there was going to be a front move in, but it was going to be later on. So we could leave 4, 4.30 and no problem. Okay. Well, I just happened to call one time about noon to check the weather again. The old boy said, if you ain't out of here by about 1 o'clock, you're not getting out of here. And I said, well, I just talked to a guy a while back, and he said, I could leave before 30. And he said, well, I don't know who you talked to. But he didn't know what he was talking about. So anyway, I hustle everybody up. We get in that airplane. We're flying out of Addison, which is north uh, of Farmer's Branch. And Melvin gets in the back. Like always, he had something he was studying on. And Bernie gets in the front. You remember Bernie, don't you? Oh, yeah. And so we take off. And, man, we're going to north before I can turn around and fly going the other direction to get to New Mexico and we haven't gone two or three miles and it turns to black you couldn't see that and it was lightning right off the wingtips of that airplane it was hailing and raining so hard you couldn't see now I had a private ticket I didn't have a, a instrument rating so all of a sudden we're kind of in trouble and I say boys we got to turn around and go back and I'll never forget Brother Newland. The words will be encased in my brain forever. He says, he just looked up from his study and he said, can't we fly around it? <laughs> and I said, even commercial airlines are not flying around this. And I guess he kept reading the book. But anyway, I turned back to that airport and it was black as your deal over here. And I'm thinking... How am I going to get this thing on the ground? Now, you remember Bernie. Bernie's eyes are about this big around because he, he had it figured out we had a problem. And I'm thinking, I didn't know how to get I can't see anything. And as we get there, it looked like a spotlight. The only place in North Texas that wasn't black as night was right over that airport and it only went from one end to the other. Just like a spotlight, I mean. Which if it hadn't, me and him wouldn't be here today for you to like us or dislike us. <laughs> anyway, we got there and I mean, you know, if you're a pilot, you, you make a, a approach lane, you make a round in, you come back in and land. And this was rather a steep decline because I wanted on the ground really bad, and I wasn't going to test the Lord to give me a whole bunch of time. And anyway, I put her in real clear, and I no more and touched that old 182 on the ground than that fog just flew right over us. And I think he still hadn't forgiven me because I didn't get him to Mexico, but I, I let him live that day. I, I know that. So. All right. Now, I hardly ever title a sermon. But once again, my boss told me I need, he needed a title. So I gave him one. Just before I get that side note, I want to tell you, you're a strong church. I've, I've been here, what, 30 minutes, an hour? You're a strong church. Because you have survived one of the Duke boys. And if you can handle that, there's nothing in your future that's going to be any kind of a problem. Okay, yeah. Yeah, well, like, like you said earlier, don't want you big here. Don't want you to know the real truth. 65 and a half feet. It's actually 65.6 feet, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Scripture comes from one you're very familiar with, the Great Commission, 
and it's a it's one that we're we're real familiar with and we'd love to hear it because it really sounds good but you know what i've found over 40 years of preaching and some of those when i learn more about them they become scary because i really find out what they're talking about and all of a sudden it's not near as much fun to read it as it was before you really understood it. So let's read it just I know you're familiar with it. Then the 11 dis, uh, disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him and some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make uh, Disciples of the nations, baptizing him in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Boy, isn't that beautiful? Until you figure out he's not just talking to the 11. Okay? Because, you know, I've studied and studied this, and I can't get out of this deal. He's talking to every Christian we are disciples of Christ if we're disciplined into him being our Christ. So I got to thinking. He talked about 49 years. Surely I'm not that old, but I, I can remember. You remember, my old people, we remember things that happened a long time ago. Can't remember what happened 15 minutes ago. Well, I remember I graduated high school in 1962 in the Panhandle, Hill, Oklahoma. Big class of 10. And I wasn't a valedictorian. <laughs> I had a social schedule and played football. I mean, you know, there's certain things that are important, and I knew what they were at that time. So. But we ran track. Everything in a small school like you do here, I, I was in the lead of the play. I was a right-hand trombone player and marching down the band. We had to quit playing football at the halftime and go out and march, you know, and then turn around back, kept the football uniform on, and play football. Yeah. And then we had track. And this scripture reminded me of track. I ran quarter mile, wasn't fast enough to run hundred yard dash, but also ran the relay race. Interesting thing, that relay race. It's a mile long, but everybody makes one circle. Most of those tracks were a quarter of a mile. So there's four guys running. Each one runs a quarter of a mile. But how fast you are, is not the most important thing. You're carrying a baton. You know, somebody's run one of these before. <laughs> You're carrying this baton, and you run as fast as you can, but the whole key to whether or not your team's going to do any good is in this handoff. Now, that handoff takes place in 65.61 something feet. I didn't ever realize that as many times as I ran it. Okay. But the key thing, the runner that's coming, which would be us today in the church, running just as fast as they can, doing the very best they can, but the whole key to success for their day is this handoff. Now, as they're running, they don't look at anybody else who's run against them what their competition is because it'll take the focus off what they're supposed to be doing. And sometimes we as a church lose our focus. So he's got to run as hard as he can. He's looking at this guy ahead of him, and he's trying to get up there because the key is one doesn't slow down for the other, and the other one doesn't slow down to the handoff. This handoff needs to be everybody runs just as fast as they possibly can. And that's where you've got this short period of time. So this guy's going to take it. He's running as hard as he can. You run as hard as he can. And you put that baton in his hand and away he goes. But remember, you can't look backward. You're the first guy. He can't look at his competition. He's got to look at the handoff. And let me tell you about that guy he hands it off to. He can't be running along here looking with his hand out. I, I mean, I saw that happen a lot of times. But they ain't, they're not going to win that race. He has to begin running with all his might and all his speed, and he's got to depend upon this guy to hand it off to him, and he never looks back. 
He's got his arm back, but he never looks back, and he waits for the thud of that baton to hit his hand, and he's going full speed already. I think we need to understand this as a church, because let me tell you what. We're carrying the baton. And even old Duke's got white hair. So you know what? Our 65.6 feet may be here. Are we going to do what he said to do? Remember, therefore go and make him disciples of all nations, baptizing him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, Spirit, teaching them to obey everything. I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the earth. For us to hand that off, the ones we're handing off to, are like the little boy up here that would rather watch than sing, and I don't blame him. But let me tell you, they're the future, and that's who we've got to hand it off to. So what kind of czar does our part of that race look like? Are we running as fast as we can? And do we understand that when we're through running, we don't just retire, but we've accomplished what we set out to do? But I'm going to tell you, one of the biggest problems when people get gray hair, they kind of want to sit back. We had a lady, not in our congregation, but a lady in an area congregation down there when a new preacher come in, they were trying real hard to get Sunday school class started because, I mean, I knew that old church and they had never had much. And this gal was an ex-school teacher, worked at school or something. I can't remember. Anyway, she had something to do with the school. But anyway, when the preacher's wife went to her, one day, she said, no, nah, I've raised my kids. Now it's somebody else's turn. You think that's who Jesus was talking to? You know, he just, it'd be nice. I'd just tickle me to death if he was just talking to those 11. But if that's the case, when all of them died, where were we at? Nobody handed off the baton. Somebody did. They did. And they paid the price to do it. Our responsibility is that we hand it off. Now, what we do, we hand them off. Okay? This is one of the reasons we're hat. Let me tell you, this cowboy hat, and I got a box out there. This thing costs a lot of money. I'll tell you where I wear it. I go to the World Quarter Horse Show in Oklahoma City, my daughter Sophie, I wear this hat. If I go to a rodeo, I wear this hat. But when I go home, I put on this hat <laughs> because this is, this is where all the work gets done. I want to tell you, I don't know how many years I've had this hat, but a bunch. And wouldn't trade this one for three of those. Because this one has memories. There's a lot of sweat stained in there. It's dirty. It's been stomped on. It's been blown off. It's been rolled around. And there's even some blood in there. But you can't buy this hat. But this is the one, when it's time to go to work, I got to have when nobody's looking. You know, at the rodeo, you get in a grand entry or whatever. You know, I regress. I, going to tell the little kids if they've been, but let me tell you, being a cowboy is nothing. Being a cowman is something. Being a stockman is what it amounts to. I've owned two sale barns, three sale barns actually in my lifetime. I was an order buyer for killer cows and stocker calves for 30 years. Okay. The key is not, I mean, those guys that just ride rodeos and all that, and it's fun, and they have to be very athletic, but most, many of them live in town. Yeah. The work must look like this. And nobody's watching. And that's when I wear this hat. Because that's where the work begins. Now, what is our work today? As I look around a church in a in 40 years of ministry and I never got a church. I don't is that your fault, Melvin? I never applied for church in my life. And never got one that was up and going. Every one of them was in the ditch when I got there. <laughs> they couldn't hire anybody else. And I was just dumb that 
okay, I'll, I'll try. And I didn't want to do that. I want to tell you, I didn't want to pray. I didn't want to preach at the Dallas Christian College. I had a business degree from Oklahoma State University. And people asked me when I first got there, because my mother was teaching down there, and I went down there to visit, that's exactly right, and then I got bored, so they needed the ground. That's back when that college had the bush hog, most of it, because that's what shape it was in. And so I'm out there bush hogging one day, just because I was bored, and I knew how to bush hog. And then this little gal walked down the sidewalk about the time I got up there to make a turnaround. And I stopped and watched a while. <laughs> which was a serious mistake. Yeah. And she said later, I don't know, she said all the girls thought us cute, but she didn't see what they was talking about. <laughs> so I think she's legally blind, she just doesn't really know it. But anyway, I did, people asked me, are you going to be a preacher? Are you nuts? I don't want to be, I'm a business graduate. And I was, became business manager at Dallas Christian College, and uh, yeah, things improved a little when Brother Newton got there. But Brother E. Dean Barr was my preacher, one of the preachers when I was a kid, and he was the president. And we got there, and my mother went down there. We were having single entry bookkeeping. And if you know much about that, I mean, it was archaic when Noah got off the boat. But <laughs> so we had a lot of work to do and went through a building program when they built that big building. I remember they'd saved up $250,000, you know, and it was gonna be wonderful, except the building cost a million, because at the time you save up $250,000, and inflation wasn't like it is now, but we had some little inflation. So I got to haunt you over that and, and get that done. But anyway, I told people, I said, I've been around this Bible college. These Bible colleges need a business manager in the worst way you ever saw, okay? Because they teach you to preach, but they don't teach anything about balancing the checkbook. Yeah. And you know, the best, worst credit history in the world comes out of preachers and policemen. Yeah. But anyway, that was uh, the name of that. So anyway, every t church I ever took was in the trash can. Never applied to a church in my life. Not sure ever wanted one. But the experience has taught me a lot in 40 years and what I've seen. And going from an old kid that thought he was bulletproof and smarter than anybody in the world and could handle it to an old man now that absolutely knows and has seen all those things. Let me tell you what our kids need. Are the, I say kids. Do you notice when you get a little older, kids become older and older? <laughs> you know, the 40 and 50 year old kids, <laughs> I mean, my goodness. They don't know anything. <laughs> They're getting younger every day. This last year, Cindy picks up the theme for a church, but we had faith over fear. Yeah. And boy, do they need to know that. I've just recently <laughs> preached several sermons on faith and worry and all that kind of thing and we kind of look at the scripture we'll get into that this morning but we look at the scripture and see what Jesus said about worrying it's the most worthless useless aggravating thing you can possibly do because I went down a whole list of things you know I mean you look at the the stock market if anybody's smart enough or wealthy enough to have anything in the stock market but uh, if you don't want to ever be bothered with that just become a preacher and you won't ever have to worry about that Stock market's going up, $5 gasoline, they were talking about not too long ago. Groceries are now up, I mean, 9.1% inflation. Where do you look? And in our country, we've got a drought going on. In, in Kaimishi Mountains, if it hadn't rained in 10 days, you've got a drought starting. It's been a lot of days since we've had a rain. So, man, you, and so are we going to have any hay? I mean, everybody down there got a few cows. We're going to have any hay? Oh, my goodness. I mean, you just... The list just gets, you haven't got time to even think about all it, let alone worry about it. And then we look at faith. Jesus, you know, first of all, he said about where you can't add one little bit to your life, any way, shape, or form. What can you really do? He's going to provide everything we need. So the faith comes in. You know what I found over 40 years? I know it's so relaxing. You know that 
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. One of the greatest things all about that is peace because you can look at 9.1% inflation. You can look at $5 a gallon gasoline. You can look at stock market going to pot. You can look at not getting enough rain, and I can totally be at peace because I believe, because he said it, he's going to give us what we need. So it's, you know, been a little bit of a challenge. It's rained east of us, it's rained west of us, it's rained south of us, and it's rained north of us. And I have to, it's a good thing I had my eyes fixed, because I looked at my rain gauge in the last two months. We've had, once we had a tent, and the other one I lied a little bit and made it a tent. <laughs> Wasn't quite there yet. But you know what? You can be at peace. That's what this next generation or the next church or the church of the future needs to know. Because otherwise, if we run around, we're worried about this, we're worried about that, what's the difference between us and the rest of the world? We're just as nuts as they are. <laughs> and the other thing I learned, you know, Christian, is that we, years ago, back, way back there when I was in Dallas Christian College, one of the big things came out, remember where everybody had to have a therapist? <laughs> and they talked about anxiety and all that, how could a Christian ever have anxiety? He won't if he's living on faith. But if he's not, then there's no difference between us and the world, so we're just as nuts as they are. These young people need to know, and boy, if I preach these last few sermons, I see guys, them young 60-year-old guys, ah, oh, the light's coming on. The light's coming on. They need to know that, but let me tell you who has to teach them. It's not me and Brother Newland. We'll do our part. The church, the church has to teach them. Because the baton is in all our hands as we go. They need to know that. Now, how do you get that? Because that sounds good, faith. I like to hear about that and, and on and on and on. But let me tell you, Dean Barr, when he preached a sermon when I was a little bitty kid, Paul on the road to Damascus and his conversion. I went home telling my grandma. She was asking me. She was visiting for some reason. Asked me about that. And I said, you know, Grandma, if I believed what he was saying, I'd be a little more enthusiastic about it. I'm sixth grade. And I said, you know, really, well, I wish he'd have told me what the story about Paul's conversion road had to do with me. So I committed, then didn't know it was, but boy, I'm going to tell you, I want it to know what it has to do with me. When I walk out of a church service or studying the scripture, I want to know something I can go do. Instead of, I had a cousin one time preaching some other relative's funeral. And he came to me afterwards. No, it was, it was my uncle. And I'll take that back. That was another uncle and another funeral. <laughs> that was my grandma's funeral. But this cousin of mine, and he was he retired colonel of the Air Force, or in the Army, came in afterwards, and he came up to me and says, Kent, you gave us a lot to think about today. I don't, I said, well, I'm a total failure then. Because thinking doesn't, I mean, you can do a little of that, but you've got to do something. So we can think about what we'd like for the church to be in the future. We'd like for one, this one to carry on. And I don't know, this may be a shock to you, but there's a lot more gray heads in here than there is others. So this ain't going to last forever. They need to know that, but let me tell you how you get there. i got to know Jesus. I got to know Jesus, not who he is. Or I got to know him as much as I know my wife. And I can't have faith in him if I don't know him. I can't have faith in her if I don't know her. Yeah. She's got a lot of faith. She keeps thinking one of these days she'll get me straightened out. And she's still working on it pretty hard. Amen. <laughs> Just goes to show that she doesn't really see beauty when she when she looks at it. Yeah, I, I knew you'd agree with me. Oh, yeah. 
So that's where we're really at. So I want you to think today you're carrying a baton. Are you running as fast as you can run in your lap? Are you ready to hand it off to, in a way that the one you're handed off to won't be distracted, won't be slowed down, won't be discouraged? Because I'm going to tell you about the gray heads. We should know Jesus. May have taken a while, but we should know him, and we have got to introduce him to the others. And one of the ways we do it, when they see peace in us, I had one of my guys, he's a deacon, he just said, he was telling the other deacon the other day, he said, you know, nothing rattles that old boy. Well, it used to. He said, nothing upsets Kent. You make a difference for it, nothing upsets him. Oh, Cindy would argue. They need to see that. Are you showing it to them? Are you showing it to your kids, to your grandkids, maybe sometimes your great-grandkids? Do they see that in you? I'm not sure how you can express it. i got a grandson turned 19, and I've told him how much I love him, and I've also told him, you know what? If you're an idiot, I'll knock your head off. I'm going to talk straight to him. Now, Grandma hugs him, and I'll have that. I'm Grandpa. Yeah. They got to know you love them, but they got to see in you, Jesus, in that relationship. They need to see that peace that we have because it's attractive. It's attractive. Isn't it amazing when we. Boy, I used to fish quite a little. And you, you let fishing poles go on sale at Walmart, and everybody, every guy you know that's fishermen will know before noon they're having a special on fishing. Okay. Especially a brand new rod reel. Are we that excited about Jesus? If we're not, let me tell you what, we're not going to be very good at handing off the baton. And Jesus talks like that's our job. And over 40 years, I, I think every once in a while, people start trying to give me an excuse or a rationale or a reason. And I said, well, right there, I've heard them all. You can't tell me a new one. We've got them. But you know what? I haven't found one that Jesus accepts yet. Oh, that's old. Oh, that's all right. You're getting old. You're a little crippled. You're this. You're that. Or whatever the case may be. I haven't found that in Scripture. Maybe you're writing a different Bible than I got, but I just can't find it in there. So he asked me what invitation he had, but it's one I used actually for three weeks at home because of what we were talking about. The key is, first of all, I've got to trust Jesus, and I've got to trust him to the point that I'll walk in faith, which means stepping into a dark room and not knowing where you're at or where you're going. But you ever notice him? He always says in all his promises, if you'll do this, I'll do this. But he never starts out, I'll do this if you'll do this. we got to do something first. And one of these days... We're going to see him face to face. And I want him to know who I am. I don't want him to have to check a book to see. I want him to know Kent on sight. Yeah. And I don't want to have to plead anything. But like old Paul, I've run a, race, run a good race. I've fought a good fight. We do that. He'll say, go over here and you're one of mine. Go over here and stand with me. Okay. That's what I want to hear. Whether I go up there or he comes back here first.
The only way we can accomplish that, first of all, we've got to trust him, be who he is, what he says, and then we've got to obey. If you go back in Deuteronomy, I can't even remember, I preached on it a couple of weeks back. Deuteronomy, Jesus talks about, or God talks about all the blessings to the Israelites, if you'll do this, going into this new land, if you'll do this, this, and this, I'm going to make this so good you can't stand it, and everybody that looks and sees you is going to think it's wonderful. That was great scripture. Then I turned the page for the next week. He talked about all the curses. If we don't truly, totally obey him and follow his command. So we got to trust and obey. So if you turn to number 349, stand as we're going to sing this invitation. If you need to make some kind of decision, you know, I'm sure everybody in here is probably a Christian. But maybe I decide, need to decide to run that race a little harder. And be concerned and focused on that handoff. You know, you've even got a youth minister here that he's like me. He's too old to be a youth minister. He's a good one. Maybe there's something you can do if you don't think. Of. I didn't think I'd ever preach it. You might argue I should have. But 40 years ago, I didn't want to. If you're exactly what God wants to use, somebody that doesn't think they can do that. That way, he gets all the credit. He can't say, oh, yeah, well, I'm really kind of talented about it. He gets all the credit. You need to make a decision. Uh, one more thing. Uh, you know, I, I'm coming in today, and I'm leaving, so I can run longer or whatever. You know why some of the best diet plans in the wor world work? It's because you got to fess up every week. you got to weigh there was one group, anyway, they put a piggy, a picture of a pig out in your front yard that you didn't, if you're the last one to do <laughs> The thing about making a public declaration is people will hold you accountable. And that's how you lose weight, if you're accountable. So if Jesus is calling you to do something, and it will be something you don't think you can do, you're not qualified, you're too old, you're too young, you're too whatever, that's exactly what he's looking for because you can't take any credit and he gets glorified. So let's say, I think it's the first and fifth verse. Is that what it says on your bulletin? Okay. When we walk with the Lord in the light of This concludes today's worship service. Thank you for listening. We hope you were encouraged by joining us on Facebook Live. Please message us if you have questions or would like more information. May God bless you and give you his peace.